Well, thank you, Matt. Um, and I will say it's, uh, it's absolutely been a pleasure for me to serve on the board of an NGO with a CEO as passionate and eloquent as, as Matt, Matt Friedman. Thank you. Um, look, it's my pleasure here to host this next panel session. Um, and we're going to explore today what, um, what banks are doing to address this social and financial crime. And we're going to be talking about driving collaboration, collective learning, following the money, and closing the financial taps on these criminals. And just a very brief recap. I mean, the profit from this industry, as estimated by the ILO, is $150 billion. As a criminal um, enterprise, it's second only to drug dealing. And every single dollar, every single dollar of, those, of that $150 billion is a proceed of crime. And therefore, by definition, as it passes through a bank, inadvertently as it may be, it is, it is, a, it is a, a, criminal enter, a criminal activity and it's a, an occasion of money laundering. And whilst most financial organizations these days are fairly well prepared when it comes to anti-money laundering procedures for crimes like drug dealing and terrorism, we are still in the early days and it is now becoming a more important imperative for banks to focus on this crime. Slavery isn't an industry that banks typically have in their strategic plans. Banks don't fund players in the supply chain knowing or consciously ignoring degrees of slavery. But we've heard about how it is in our everyday life. But banks are exposed and they are increasingly coming together to talk about it, to, to work with regulators and civil society. So today it is my pleasure to um, introduce our panel, um, a very diverse panel. Three of them have police careers. Um, and their, their profiles are quite extensive, so I'm going to try and be brief um, so we can get to the conversation. But let me first talk um, and introduce Lonika van Zundert, um, Regional Head Security and Intelligence Management, Asia and the Middle East for ABN AMRO. Um, Lonica joined ABN in January 2014 and uh, is responsible for compliance, crime and integrity, which includes both internal and external investigations, intelligence and incident handling, conduct and prevention, all in five days a week. Um, prior to joining ABN, Lonica worked for the Dutch Law Enforcement um, and has worked in Asia um, well over 10 years. Uh, Ken, Ken Pemberton, next to Lonica. Um, he's, got, he's a man with a title that I've always wanted but never received. He is Regional Head of Intelligence uh, for Greater China and Northeast Asia, um, and covering the financial crime compliance area of Standard Chartered Bank. And he's got an incredible academic and professional profile, um, and a nice guy. Qualified Barrister at Law, Masters of Laws, BSc in Politics, Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialist, Certified Fraud Examiner, ICA diplomas in anti-money laundering, compliance, and financial crime pre prevention. Well done for that. Um, prior to working at Standard Chartered, Ken has worked in the field of fraud management and standards at Citibank. Um, and before that, he was a Hong Kong police detective superintendent in Hong Kong in Central, with over 100 detective officers working for him. So we're delighted to have Ken on board. Um, and, and next to Ken, Kerry, Kerry Stairs, Global Head of Legal at Thomson Reuters Foundation and Head of the Foundation's Trust Law Pro Bono Initiative. Uh, Kerry, you started your career um, in dispute resolution at Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, and in 2012, you left private practice for a life in the NGO world with Action Aid. Um, and then you joined Thomson Reuters in September 2015 as Head of Legal. And, and you lead the trust law program, which works with NGOs and social enterprise. So you, you match pro bono lawyers with, with their needs. Um, Kerry has a first class degree of, in law, scholarship from Cambridge, and a master's degree in human rights from University College London. Welcome. And, and lastly, to my right, Neil Giles, another policeman, head of the Global Knowledge Center program for UK-based NGO Stop the Traffic. And Neil had a 30-year career with the Metropolitan Police and at one point in time had over 600 investigators working for him. 
2006, he joined as deputy director of the new serious organized crime agency leading the human intelligence department and in his final year of service became chief operating officer of the child exploitation and online protection unit. And Neil, since 2008, has led Stop the Traffic's human trafficking intelligence development work and currently leads their Global Knowledge Centre program. So thank you, Neil, also for making the trip all the way from London. So with that, let's get started. Um, and maybe let me start with, with our two bankers, Ken, Ken from Standard Chartered and Lanika from, from ABN. You represent two of nine banks that collaborate together uh, with the Mekong Club. So you are representing a group of engaged um, and empowered banks. Um, let's start by talking about what's tough. Lonica, maybe what do you see as the key challenges and hurdles for banks in Asia um, as they try to take on and embrace this, this challenge? Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, that's working. Oh. Yeah. That's a nice way to start a conversation uh, by challenges. Um, I first want to make another point. Uh, when you introduced uh, me, you said um, having a, a background in law enforcement, moving to the private sector, uh, the financial sector, um, I received many questions from people that actually questioned my move. I, being in law enforcement, uh, being in the police, uh, many choose that career path because you want to do the right thing. And then moving to an industry that doesn't have the best reputation um, <laughs> triggered a few questions. And um, it was a very easy one for me because uh, uh, Matt already explained we are in this together because we are facing the same regulations uh, and it has become a business risk. But that's not the only reason why we, uh, as ABN and as Standard Charter, are involved. Um, banking is all about the numbers, um, but we want to do the business in a sustainable way. Uh, we can be selective, uh, not only in the industries that we choose to be uh, present, but also the clients that we um, onboard. And um, I think to answer your questions, um, I think one of the most challenging thing for us is uh, lack of awareness, not among like-minded people uh, as yourself, uh, not among colleagues within the foundation, within the banks, or sustainability department, or my department, um, but the front line, we still have bankers that need to meet the targets, and uh, I think they have a limited understanding of the scope and the impact that crimes as human trafficking might have um, on society. So it's those people that have to get the clients in, it's those people that we trust their assessment on. So I would say lack of awareness um, as number one. Um, also, we talked about monitoring of transactions. Um, there's a limitation to that. We do have certain risk indicators, red flags, uh, but we can autom automate those because uh, many of the risk indicators, red flags attached, attached to human trafficking are not that tight risk factors that you can automate. A lot of those factors um, are maybe, as we call in the police, zeros on itself, and altogether they become a one. Uh, so as long as you don't look at the holistic relationship um, or in combination with banks, you might not identify uh, human trafficking incidents because a lot of those transactions are not dissimilar to normal commercial uh, transactions. Uh, thirdly, do I have time for a third? No. No, no one, one that, 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 that creates a bridge to go, why please, we're here. Go ahead. Uh, information and intelligence sharing. Um, Coming from a law enforcement background, I actually wish I knew everything I have learned uh, in my almost four years with the bank because we want to do the right thing and we think we're pretty good at doing it. Uh, but looking at the conviction rate of uh, human trafficking violators, we are very limited. And uh, But that also goes uh, back to the banks. The banks play a key role, but we're also very limited. And uh, it's about that bridge. It's about doing it together. And I think one of the challenges is um, a lack of information or intelligence. 
uh, to be as effective as we can. Uh, so to, to get all parties involved and make efficient use of that information that is out there, I find a big challenge too. Thank you. And Thank now you. I will stop. <laughs> Uh, Ken, let, let me, let's get a bit technical. I know there's a few, few groups of um, banks and, and, and financial services professionals in the room, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about the actual policies, tools and procedures that a bank implements to, to, to ensure that the front line sure. do the right thing? Okay. Um, well, Standard Chartered is one of the banks that's fighting human trafficking. Um, you may know that our motto is here for good. Um, in fact, well, that, of course, means doing the right thing, as Lonica just mentioned. Um, but it's in, for Standard Chartered, I think it's more than just a motto. It's really an ethos that the board and the CEO and the members of the bank uh, try to live up to on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, fighting human trafficking is one of our strategic priorities. So Mark asked, how does that translate into policies and procedures within the bank? And I think um, maybe three domains. The first one is standard chartered as an employer with regard to the human rights of all of our staff. We have operations in 68 countries, over 86,000 employees. Of course, we have policies and procedures, code of conduct and a speak up channel all of which are designed to safeguard and protect the human rights of all of our employees. And the second domain is really uh, standard chartered as a purchaser of goods and services. We have 18,000 suppliers. So we have, of course, procurement policies and procedures that have a focus on the supply chain. And I think for the rest of the afternoon, you're probably going to hear quite a lot about the human trafficking risks in supply chains. So we have a supplier's charter, we have position statements, and um, our suppliers are subject to audit to ensure that they are complying with the standards that we are setting. And the third domain is really SCB as a provider of products and services to our clients. So we want to know from our clients what do they intend to do with the goods and services we are providing. And that translates into an environmental and social risk assessment for appropriate occasions. That has a human trafficking aspect to it. And it enables the bank to assess the clients to assess the risk of human trafficking involvement. And we have um, a special team that will go on site when required to conduct uh, client due diligence. On a, a more granular, granular note, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we conduct um, transaction monitoring. Uh, Matt mentioned that earlier. We monitor transactions against watch lists like WorldCheck to see if there are any connections with, the, with um, human trafficking. We conduct deep dive analyses into our clients, selected clients. We will want to see the big picture, identify all their connected parties to see what risk there is of human trafficking. And of course, on a day-to-day -day basis, we conduct um, adverse media monitoring to see if anything mentioned in the media, an entity, an individual, uh, a typology, if any of that can be mapped to the bank if we have any connection. Okay, thank you. And maybe, maybe Neil, I'll turn, turn to you now. Um, you, you consult banks and you consult private sector. If you look at, look at both areas, what do you think banks need to do more to, to be more effective? I think Matt's very effectively told us that, that we're, we're losing the battle and we need, we need to do better. So what, what, what are your key observations that banks need to do, to, to do better? Thanks, Mark. Um, our sense of the world is that we need to uh, become much more prevention focused than we currently are. 
um, and much, much more systemic in our approach to this problem. You've seen the numbers that Matt put on the screen earlier. Mm -hmm. At the moment, scratching the surface is, is an exaggeration. Um, so we need to do more and we need to be intelligently led. And I need to hold the microphone higher. Um, and we need to be intelligently led, uh, which frankly means uh, that banks and financial institutions are going to have to seek more sources of information and different sources of information if they're going to build a picture that truly helps us to do that. And you're talking about KYC? Or? Yeah, I'm going to build into KYC. I, I, this is about money. People don't do slavery for fun. They do it for money. Uh, that money inevitably hits financial institutions. Um, and uh, particularly when it's forced labor, um, these are legi apparently le legitimate businesses who, who give their bankers balance sheets. The clues are there, ladies and gentlemen. We don't look at balance sheets in the right way. If someone is using exploited labor or they don't pay enough for their contract labor, the clues are going to be in the balance sheet and you need to read them in a different way. Um, there are some radical approaches. Uh, I truly believe that working more collaboratively with an NGO world that is beginning to come together on a common platform uh, to understand what we each know about the business and how we can understand how those things that we know, those hotspots in trafficking, those trends in trafficking, how we can translate those across to, to the industry that finance and banking is. Um, but we need to step our game up significantly so that we can start making a transformational change um, to business and commerce. Thank you. Uh, Kerry, can I, can I turn to you? We just touched, touched on the word collaboration. I think we're going to hear the word collaboration quite a lot today. Um, you collaborate, actually, with Stop the Traffic in Europe, and, and, and the Thomson Reuters Foundation has created a, a, a US and a European Banks Alliance. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of those alliances and then your, your plans for Asia Pacific? Very happy to. I'm the, I'm the only non-COP on the panel, in case you haven't guessed. Um, can I just start by um, explaining what the foundation is for anyone that hasn't come across us before? Um, we bear the Thomson Reuters name, um, but we are, in fact, an independent non-profit organisation. Um, we design and deliver programmes around the world uh, that drive socio-economic progress and aim to strengthen the rule of law. Um, like the Thomson Reuters business, we are very well known for our work in the area of anti-trafficking and modern slavery. Uh, and amongst the initiatives that we run are a number of programmes that are designed to support the private sector really to step up and play uh, a valuable role in the fight. One of those is, is the Banks Alliance Against Trafficking, which is um, what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, that was created uh, back in 2013 by our, uh, our CEO at the foundation, Monique uh, Villa, recognizing the role that financial institutions had to play as holders of invaluable data, data that can help identify uh, and can help prosecute uh, perpetrators of slavery. Um, in essence, it's a series of regional multi-stakeholder working groups. It, it brings together actors that don't always collaborate, that don't always trust each other, don't always speak the same language. Um, that's banks as, as the holders of the, these troves of data. It's, it's NGOs like, like Stop the Traffic, like Mekong, like Liberty Asia, who through their work day in, day out, have, have real world intelligence about how money is moving. Uh, it brings together law enforcement. We've heard a lot about the important role that law enforcement needs to play. Uh, if they have capacity and resources to prosecute. Um, and last but not least, the, the foundation. And we, we are not, um, by any stretch of the imagination, financial crime experts. We act as a neutral convener and coordinator, helping facilitate that, that communication and collaboration. And what the uh, Alliance Working Groups have done is to collaborate to do two things, really. One is to map the financial footprint of trafficking as it happens in that particular region. Uh, and the second thing is from that to develop concrete and practical guidance for banks about what to look for, what to look for in their financial flows, their transactional data, what to look for in their know your client and customer due diligence checking, um, and what to look for in branches. There's a great deal of suspicious activity uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that plays out in branches day in, day out. Mm. Um, and this, this, uh, this work product, it helps banks refine their automatic transaction monitoring, although, as we've heard, that's not the, the whole story. Uh, it helps banks develop um, really focused and robust investigation profiles internally. Um, it helps them train staff, so whether that's training internal investigators or training branch staff, um, the work product of these alliances is really um, a valuable tool for that. Um, as I said, we started back in 2013 in the United States. Um, that working group produced what's become known as the White Paper that was published in 2014. 
Um, we have most recently done uh, a similar project in Europe. Uh, that came to fruition this year. We convened it first in 2015. Uh, it published its uh, its toolkit, its anti-trafficking toolkit, this year. So it was a long process. The collaboration is not necessarily speedy. Um, but the toolkit uh, has had a phenomenal response. It's a, a list of indicators of suspicious activity uh, spanning transactional data, know your client, and physical behavioral in-branch indicators. Um, and it, it also gives guidance to banks on how you can practically go about operationalizing some of these indicators uh, in your institution. Um, it's been now endorsed by the Wolfsburg Group of Banks. For anyone that's uh, not familiar with them, I certainly wasn't before I started this work. Um, they're a, an alliance of the world's biggest banks that really drive standard setting in financial crime. And, and if you go on their website, you'll see that the, the European Banks Alliance Toolkit is now endorsed by them as an industry standard. Uh, the International Financial Action Task Force um, uh, is also uh, endorsing the work. And it's been presented to the Egmont Group, so the uh, International Association of, uh, of financial investigation units worldwide. So it's, it's really getting some profile, and it's a great example of how banks working in collaboration with NGOs are helping to drive industry standards. They're helping to, to, to improve the position. And, and maybe turning back to Lonica and Ken, so is Asia different from, from Europe? I mean, I think the work that's been done with alliances in the US and Europe have, have started to really look for patterns and maps and flags and the typologies. What do you see that's different in, in this part of the world, Lonica? I think the problem is uh, more prone here. Um, for us, our business lines are different here. We are big in Europe, our mortgages, retail, uh, clients and so on. Um, in Asia, we focus on corporate banking. Uh, that also includes uh, the diamond sector. We are one of the biggest financers of diamond and jewelry clients. Uh, so the issues, um, the problem in itself, is different from what my colleagues in Netherlands are facing. Um, I would say public-private partnership is different. Uh, I'm a big fan and supporter of that. Uh, I find it um, the cooperation and the collaboration in the Netherlands uh, is easier uh, from what I understand than it has been in Asia so mm. far. And I think that's something that we can build upon further. Um, let me turn to Ken, let me be specific. So banks um, typically can't work together because customer data is sacrosanct and you can't share oh. data. So Ken, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how do you step above the detail of a client where you might be suspicious, but you can't share that? How, how do you work together to, and I want you to talk in a bit more detail about flags and typologies because pe people might have heard the word and, and Matthew introduced it, but can you be a bit more specific about what that looks like and how, how do you customize that for collective use and value? Sure, thank you. Um, I'd just like to add to Lonica's comments. I think in this particular region we have language issues that might not exist so strongly in Europe. I think we have a number of unfriendly governments in this region uh, that aren't overly concerned about fighting human trafficking. Um, I think there are some countries in the region that are not as developed as those in Europe. And I think there is less enabling legislation in this region. I'm particularly thinking about the UK legislation that enables the, uh, the so-called GIMLET, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, operates th um, in London, that has legislation that enables banks to share information. We don't have that in Hong Kong. Um, so we have to make use of current legislation, which means basically using the exemptions under, under the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance. Now, to answer your question, um, you mentioned uh, red flags and typologies. Yes, there is an issue. Everyone knows there's an issue about uh, data sharing. Um, it's not a, a complete block. Um, it does happen. We have a fraud and money laundering intelligence task force. It's just been established in May this year by the Hong Kong police force. Um, that enables vertical sharing uh, between financial institutions and the police. Cons uh, concerning um, uh, active investigations they have. It doesn't enable horizontal sharing between banks. Um, 
With regard to red flags and typology reports, um, the banks collate information from um, global sources that will indicate, that will provide red flags for money laundering. And the red flags will typically appear in what's called a typology report, which Matt mentioned earlier and gave the idea of. So the typology report will, a typical typology report um, would fit a set of circumstances. So for instance, if it's um, human trafficking in the Thai food industry, it would show uh, the movement of people into the business and it will also show the fund flows. Um, and it would give you a, a nice picture that you could map against other fund flows um, that the bank, the bank might see. We are able to share red flags. Uh, we are able to share typology reports. So um, Stan Chart hosts an intelligence roundtable every quarter. We invite uh, the banks in Hong Kong. We normally have seven or eight attend. Recently, we had um, the Mekong Club come to give a presentation that included red flags. We've had Liberty Asia make a presentation as well. So. The banks do use red flags, the banks do use um, typology reports. Um, with regard to the red flags, when we conduct deep dive analyses, we are actually looking for red flags. Um, and I think the final point I'd make is really commenting again on what Lonica mentioned. Identifying human trafficking is not easy because the people who are engaged in it don't want to be discovered. So they try to hide all the tracks. Some of the people involved are, they know the banking system, they know what we'll be looking for, they try to conceal what they are doing, they try to conceal the fund flows using, using shell companies and possibly legitimate other companies as front companies to layer the funds and hide the, tra the trail, the, the, the fund flows. And so, although we can identify a number of red flags, it might not indicate human trafficking. It might indicate money laundering. And so it's not unusual for banks when they conduct an analysis to have a number of red flags and to think there's something wrong here, but we're not sure it's money laundering. It, uh, sorry, we're not sure it's human trafficking. So we would normally, of course, make a report uh, to, to the Hong Kong police, a suspicious transaction report, and they would take up an investigation as they saw fit. OK, can I, please, can I jump in? dive in, Karen. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with your explanation of all of the challenges that we're going to face replicating this Banks Alliance initiative in, in Asia, in APAC. Um, but there are some opportunities. I think Absolutely, um, it's it. important not to forget those. Um, uh, I should say that we are having a, a, a kickoff meeting of sorts for the new APAC Banks Alliance uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we have a full room, <laughs> which is good. Uh, we at the foundation are working in partnership with the Mekong Club um, to launch and to steer that. Uh, Liberty Asia will be in the room. Uh, Stop the Traffic will be in the room. So it's a, it's a, a genuine collaboration. Um, and we are aware of the challenges. Um, we, we don't simply seek to take what we've done before and cookie cutter it into a new region. Part of the reason the collaboration can take so long is that we're really sensitive working um, with regional diversity, working out exactly what it is that we can uh, develop that will make a real contribution in the, in the region in which we're working. Um, but I think the opportunities are uh, as follows. There's a real direction of travel here. Um, there is new legislation popping up all over the place, as, as Matt talked about earlier. Um, regulators and standard setters are increasingly interested in this issue, um, FATF, Wolfsburg, and so on. Um, just like there was momentum in the UK, there's real momentum in Australia, and Australian banks will be in the room and be a really active yeah. part of the APAC Banks Alliance. And I'm hoping that in the same way that we capitalised on that momentum in, for the European uh, initiative, we'll be able to do so here. Um, and perhaps most importantly, and this is what gives me the most comfort, this will be a roaring success, is that the banks that have been the driving force of the alliance in other parts of the world, the Standard Charters, the HSBCs, the, the ABN AMROs, um, are in the room. Um, and that means there's an institutional commitment to making progress, and there's lots of institutional expertise within the banks that are participating. So I'm confident that uh, between us, we will, we will um, replicate the success of the, of the alliances in the US and, and in Europe. Thank you. I am equally confident. Now, when I, when I spoke to, to, to Neil about um, some, some things he wanted to talk about, he said, whatever I ask him, he's going to ignore. So I'm now not going to ask him a question and 
You, you, please, you've flown all the way. What's on your mind? A couple of things. <laughs> um, I, I, just to finish off that conversation about um, Bankers Alliance, um, I'm most encouraged by the post-meeting developments um, of the European Bankers Alliance. They're um, asking many more questions of NGOs than we ever expected um, and, and looking to collaborate much more than we ever expected. Uh, so there's life after a Bankers Alliance coming up with a, a, a menu of typologies and red flags, um, which I never in my investigative career ever thought I would say. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're not going to prosecute our way out of this problem. Neither are we going to rescue and rehabilitate our way out of this problem. Y you've seen the numbers. Um, we've all got a part to play in prevention, which means we're going to have to take more risks. Um, and, and that would be what I encourage you to do. Um, I have all sorts of concerns about high net worth individuals that you bank for uh, and the scramble for their business. Um, I, I, I do think banking's going to have to look carefully at that, at that part of their business world uh, and risk assess it in a different way. Um, uh, because that's where the money's going, folks. Um, not everybody is Bill Gates with a great plan. Um, and and that's, that's a tough world to open up. But there is hope. Um, as the world gets more connected, these things in everybody's hands, even in the poorest kids' hands in some parts of the world where they're very vulnerable, um, there are opportunities to reach them. Uh, and, and, and the simple maxim is, if you know more, you can do more. Thank you. Now, I'd like to open up the floor to, to, to questions. Uh, th there's going to be mics passed around, so if you could uh, put your hand up if you've got a question, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, take it at the panel. Any questions? Thank you. Just over here. Hi, I'm Jalita Panjaitan from Linklaters. Just an interest, interested to hear the commentary from um, both from the two banks in particular, I guess, uh, big clients of the firm, obviously. But just interested also in from the KYC perspective and AML diligence perspective, the point that, that Neil's just picked up, which is the difference between diligencing a corporate client in relation to you know, a significant transaction, capital raising, et cetera, or a significant product you want to sell them versus, um, versus a, a WM client, so a wealth management uh, client and both of you have very big private bank uh, businesses. Just you know whether there is a distinction in approach there, or um, you have to take a risk-based or a volume-based sort of approach in terms of in terms of the additional diligence you do. Okay. Actually, can I just say? I mean, I used to be head of sustainability for Standard Chartered, and and it became very obvious to us very quickly that there was no point having policies for the corporate bank that didn't apply to people that own businesses in the private bank, so your question is absolutely, absolutely spot on. Yeah, maybe to add on that, uh, we defy the world and the business lines in different risk categories, um, low, medium, high risk. Uh, so if, um, say, diamond uh, jewelry clients from Africa, uh, uh, our relationship managers have a lot more screening due diligence obligations than, say, a certain company in Europe uh, that falls in a low uh, risk category. But um, a comment that I want to make for all screening, all, all clients, and that's something that we want to encourage, is we're not doing this to please the regulator. We're doing this because we want to do the right thing. And even on the biggest criminal, you can get a clean sheet of screening. Uh, it depends how you conduct the screening. And um, I think that's why I appreciate Neil's comment so much. Like so many of the offenders or criminals, you don't find the world check on open source uh, media. And it comes down to a lot of common sense that we want to uh, instill and embed in the culture and within the front line. And, uh, I think that mindset should be used no matter which clients, no matter which business line uh, you're in. Yeah, I, I do agree with the comments. I think, um, of course, all the banks have to take a risk-based approach. They have finite resources. So it's necessary um, to use the intelligence that they have um, and, and to devote their, their, you know, their attention accordingly. Any other questions? Oh, there's one right in the middle at the back there. Table 13, I think. Hi, 
Ursula McCormack from Kingwood Mallisons. Um, uh, I've heard from, um, from Matt actually speaking before that um, there is a need to work with clients, not just exclude them um, from financial services. And there's a growing concern at an international level about financial inclusion. So how do you, as, as uh, financial institutions, strike that balance when you're dealing with a client uh, specifically that has a, that has a bad report? Um, do you give them the benefit of the doubt and try and work with them to, to deal with their supply chain issues? Or how, how do you work through that process internally? Uh, that depends on the nature of the adverse media, uh, I would say, to start with. We have a motto, comply, improve, and don't exclude. Uh, we believe in engagement. Um, uh, because, as I said, we, we want to bank, but we want to do it uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't hold for all banks. Uh, so if we would turn certain clients away, they might be picked up by other banks that have less strict regulations or business principles. Uh, so we do like to engage. Maybe I can give a quick example. Um, in the Netherlands, prostitution is legal. Uh, we had a client that was exploiting a website on which uh, third parties could advertise their services. Uh, as I said, that's legal and we were financing this client uh, till we came across adverse media reporting that some people that were being advertised on the website uh, were maybe advertised um, Unvoluntarily, there were a few issues with that, and the easiest thing for us would have been to exit the client because there was adverse media attached to it. We we don't want to have anything to do uh, with that. Let me uh, uh, double confirm that. But instead, we decided to engage. We had a meeting with the client. We explained it. This client um, obviously didn't want to involve in uh, that kind of wrong wrongdoing either. So we successfully. Um, with law enforcement had an operation and for uh, suspects were being arrested and prosecuted and the client is, is, is a very happy customer of us and we are happy that we uh, chose to engage uh, them. But I would say it depends on the nature of the allegations or the wrongdoing as well, the certain type of clients, that's a big no, obviously. I mean, I'd like to just um, make a comment. Uh, one of the challenges of man many of the banks, certainly the banks in the financial services group of the Mekong Club, are also seven of the nine are actually already members of the US and the European Banks Alliance working with Thomson Reuters Foundation. So many of the banks that are working in this area and collaborating are already fairly enlightened. The, the challenge that takes place when you start talking to, whether it's in forestry or it's fisheries or around parts of Southeast Asia, is if you just exit a client for, for breaches, any number of local banks that don't have any policies or procedures just dive in and think they're really good at marketing because they've beaten an international bank. So there's, there, there is always that tension, but I do think you need to have absolute, some things are just no-go zones and you do need to absolutely have some policies. And I think the greatest thing that is happening with collaboration now with banks is they're starting to realize that clear policies and procedures, position statements, in, in, in a sense, a philosophy of operation has to be above everything. And you, some, some issues you just cannot go over the line. And I think the subject for today is a subject you cannot draw the line. Um, if you're talking about fisheries and shark's fin, you might give if, if you've got a zero policy on sharks, then you might give a client three months to get out or exit. But I think if you find slavery in the supply chain that is not being dealt with, you, you're done. I think you have to be prepared to give up the business. Um, can I um, ask if there's any last questions and then I'll, I'll wrap up. No? Okay, look, um, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to just wrap up and say, look, one of the motivations for, for banks, um, and pretty well for any major company, is actually pr protecting and preserving its reputation. And, and whilst that may not be the, the right motivation for getting on the right side of this discussion, getting, getting to grips with managing reputation for avoiding public fines, this is a motivation that is allowing and, and now creating uh, an environment for banks to sort of work it out together. But actually, the real prize is when you start to see collaborations. 
identifying cases, disrupting trafficking trends, and actually making it harder and harder for these people to move their money or have their money frozen. And I do think that we are now shifting um, as an industry around the world and talking obsessively about this. And I do think the, the next stage, and this is what Kerry and I have been doing and are going to be doing, is we're reaching out now and saying this isn't Hong Kong, nine enlightened banks. We have to make it Asia Pacific and we have to go to Singapore and Thailand and we need to go to Japan and China and get the big local banks to start leading the way. And, and that otherwise what happens is it just keeps finding another corner where, where the problem just gets replicated. So um, we, we're tight on time, so I want to thank my panel for, for firstly traveling and for speaking, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you.